I've got a good puzzle for you today, if you believe you're a good programmer. Can you write a short Python 3 function, q, that takes in a string s1 and returns a string s2 such that if you append s2 to the string x equals to form a Python assignment statement, and then you execute that statement, then first of all the statement doesn't crash. And second, we have that x is equal to s1 for every valid Python string s1. If you execute those statements here, the result should always be true. If you ever get false, or if you get a syntax error, then you have failed. Here is a naive attempt at the function q that simply adds double quotes around the input string s1. This works for many test cases, but it doesn't work if s1 contains an unescaped double quote. Most programmers get this kind of thing wrong, and this brings us to the topic of today's lecture. Welcome to Frank's Day Unexplains. I'm a professor of security and privacy at the University of Cambridge, and this is a lecture in my security course for second year computer science undergraduates. Today's topic is SQL injection, made popular in geek circles by an often reprinted XKCD cartoon. Once again, I'll issue my standard warning, stay legal. I'm teaching you real-world attacks, because otherwise you will never be able to be a competent cyber defender, but it's up to you to use this superpower responsibly. SQL injection is another one of those old and well-known vulnerabilities that do not seem likely to go away soon, even though a reasonable and effective countermeasure is available. There are many contexts in which data is stored in a database, and some interface is provided for users to query or update the database directly from a web page or some other kind of remote application. The idea is that the developer prepares a parametric SQL statement along the lines of show me all the rows with this field equal to x and asks the user to supply the values for the parametric fields. The trouble is that the statement is constructed by pasting the user supplied values into a template string and then feeding that string to the database engine for it to be interpreted as an SQL statement. The core of the vulnerability is that the user input gets inserted into the template as is, and then the result gets parsed as a command. Therefore, since the user input is not properly quoted, it may escape the boundaries of the input field and escalate from merely being data to becoming a command itself. The attacker has thus injected some SQL, which he was not supposed to be able to write, into the system, and the attacker is now able to read other data or even modify the database. I recommend you do the seed lab on SQL injection, at least tasks 2 and 3. Task 1 is a trivial SQN one-liner with no security content, and task 4 you may consider optional. As usual, your textbook has further details if you get stuck. The reason why I opened this lecture on SQL injection with a problem that seemed totally unrelated to SQL is because the root cause of this security vulnerability, and also of many others, is failing to quote user input correctly. It is a problem that resurfaces in many contexts. I would argue that not only SQL injection, but also buffer overflow, cross-site scripting, and all the cases where a program is abused for having invoked a system instead of exec v, are all instances of that. The sad truth is that most programmers are rubbish at quoting, and that this incompetence at quoting user input is an inexhaustible source of vulnerabilities. OK, so let me now introduce you to the lovely mum of Little Bobby Tables, for the few of you who haven't already come across her. Let's just read this classic comic strip together. Hi, this is your son's school. We are having some computer trouble. Oh dear, did he break something? In a way, did you really name your son Robert, apostrophe, close bracket, semicolon, drop table students, semicolon, hyphen, hyphen, space? Oh yes, Little Bobby Tables, we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. So what just happened there? It is one more instance of this general problem whereby the programmer expects data, just passive stuff to be operated upon, and the attacker manages to sneak in some bytes that end up being executed as very active code. Buffer overflow that we studied in another video over there was another instance of that, and there are more, and it is one of the most general patterns of security vulnerability. Let's have a closer look. Of course, you must remember a bit of the SQL that you did in the databases course that you took last year. 
What kind of program do you think accepted that malicious input that the mom sent? Clearly, it was something that took a string from the user and plugged it into a half-formed SQL command and then executed the command. What could have been the shape of that SQL command? So this is some basic SQL to display data for a particular student called Jennifer. Select from where is the classic SQL pattern. Select the name and grade from students where name equals Jennifer. Presumably the school had some front end where you could enter any name and it would be then plugged in there between the quotes instead of Jennifer. Now, what happens if we put the name of the boy in the comic? The name is Robert, apostrophe, close bracket, semicolon, drop table students, semicolon, hyphen, hyphen, space. So if we insert it, we get this select query over here. And we see that this causes the original SQL statement to conclude in an unexpected place, in the middle of its argument, actually. There is a, uh, then a second statement, which is the destructive payload, drop table students, and then a double hyphen plus space that comments out the closing quote bracket and semicolon that would otherwise cause a syntax error. Note the following points about this attack. First, the field must be terminated, and here this is done by the single quote after Robert. Second, the vulnerable statement must be terminated as well, and here this is done by the semicolon, which is always necessary, and also by the preceding close bracket, which is not strictly necessary in SQL, but anyway, if there is an open bracket, then there has to be a close bracket, of course. Three, the payload, here drop table students, must then be inserted as its own separate statement. Four, the payload itself must be terminated in order to be syntactically correct, and here this is done with the semicolon after drop table students. And five, after the payload, whatever is left of the original SQL statement template must be commented out, otherwise it would cause a syntax error. Here that is done by the double hyphen plus space that marks the start of a comment in SQL, which extends to the end of the current line. Now for the countermeasures. The mom's advice in the last panel is that the school ought to have sanitized its database inputs. Well, what does that mean? If the input routine of the web form had disallowed the single quote character, the attacker would not have been able to perform step two of the attack. If the routine had disallowed the semicolon, the attacker would not have been able to perform step four. And if the routine had disallowed the double dash, then this would have thwarted step five. However, this reactive approach of attempting to forbid the meta characters is rarely reliable, especially if homebrew. Plus, you might actually need some of these characters. And ingenious attackers may find other ways of terminating the substring, particularly when the result is subjected to more than one round of further parsing. Excluding meta characters is a rather blunt approach to quoting, which betrays the incompetence of the program. Go back to the exercise at the start of the video. The sophisticated and correct form of quoting is one in which any user input, whatever the meta characters in it, is transformed and escaped in a way that guarantees it will only be interpreted as data. If you were able to solve the challenge at the start of the video, which by the way my brilliant student Johnny solved in half an hour, you should be using your function to quote the user input before concatenating it with a half-formed SQL statement. But many homebrew quoting functions fail on unexpected special cases. A preferred countermeasure against SQL injection is to use a prepared statement in which the parametric SQL query is submitted to the database engine, parsed and pre-compiled, uh, kind of with some holes in it. Then at runtime, the parameters are plugged into those blanks and the query is executed with the fields as data and they remain data and without reparsing the SQL statements, so there's no chance that they're going to be interpreted as commands. But the additional programming effort involved, although modest in theory, is still sufficient, apparently, to deter some programmers from adopting this practice, leading to the persistence of SQL injection vulnerabilities in currently deployed software systems. Notice how the mom's chosen payload in the cartoon is highly destructive. Essentially, this is denial of service or vandalism, basically, which is an availability threat. But it is pretty easy to detect as soon as it happens, this kind of attack, because everything stops working. <laughs> the, the school phones, uh, phones the home of the mom. And it's relatively easy to recover from, provided that the victim ran some sensible backup regime. Perhaps an optimistic thought, uh, seeing how the person at the other end of the phone reacts. Now, a more subtle payload, which just exfiltrated some data, 
uh, which would be a confidentiality threat, or altered some data, which would be an integrity threat. Uh, now that would be something that uh, might be harder to detect and difficult or impossible to recover from, impossible in the case of the uh, data exfiltration. I mean, once, once it's gone, it's gone. A common idiom in SQL injection attacks is to disable the filter in the WHERE clause by making the condition always true. For example, by appending OR 1 equals 1, OR something that's always true. Then, instead of getting just the rows that match the originally intended Boolean condition, you get all the rows as if the WHERE clause wasn't there. This is also useful for bypassing parts of the pre-written condition that you don't know how to fulfill, such as, for example, if the WHERE included if the password is a correct one, then you, you transform that to if the password is the correct one or if one equals one. And the first Boolean predicate will be false since you can't supply the correct password, but the second one will be true and you will be let in. So try applying this technique to your seed lab exercises and see where this gets you. Today's video was a bit shorter than average also to compensate for the fact that I dumped on you those tutorials on buffer overflow that uh, were rather long, even though they are not uh, officially uh, parts of the lecture series. So, uh, anyway, use the time saved today to catch up on any seed labs you still haven't completed. It's important that you do them. In the next video, we'll be talking about a security technology that every computer user hates with a passion, and which is the cause of many spectacular break-ins that you read about in the news. Back in 2004, Bill Gates publicly predicted the death of this technology, but it is still very much around us even today, passwords. Thank you very much for watching till the end. Like, subscribe, comment, have fun injecting your SQL into the target machine in your seed lab, and I'll see you in that next video.